prophet Haggai. Chapter 2. Haggai 2. I will read from verse 3. Who is left among you that saw this house in her first glory? How do you see it now? Is it not in your eyes in comparison of it as nothing? Yet now be strong, O Zerubbabel. Say the Lord, and be strong, O Joshua, the son of Josedek, the high priest, and be strong, all ye people of the land, say the Lord, and walk, for I am with you, say the Lord of hosts, according to the word that I covenanted with you when ye came out of Egypt, so my spirit remaineth among you, fear ye not. For thus said the Lord God of hosts, yet once, it is a little while, and I will shake the heavens and the earth and the sea and the dry land. And I will shake all nations, and the desire of all nations shall come, and I will fill this house with glory. God says he will fill this house with glory. Say the Lord of hosts. The silver is mine, and the gold is mine, said the Lord of hosts. The glory of this latter house shall be greater than the former. And in this place, I will give peace, said the Lord of hosts. Romans chapter 8. Romans chapter 8. And verse 2. For the law of the spirit of life in Christ Jesus has made me free from the law of sin and death. For the law of the spirit of life in Christ Jesus has made me free from the law of sin and death. In the name of Jesus, the law of the spirit of life will make you free from the law of sin and death in the mighty name of Jesus. I'm sharing with the people of God this morning on the glory of the latter house. The glory of the latter house. We have just read from the book of Haggai and we have considered the prophecy that God gave through him Ages ago, which must find fulfillment because the word of God cannot fall to the ground. And at the end of it, the Lord spoke and spoke expressly and said, The glory of the latter house shall be greater than the former. And I like to tell the people of God that when God says it, nobody can stop it. Because God will always have the final word. No matter what the challenges may be, no matter what the difficulties may be, no matter how obscure or difficult the circumstances may be, what God says is what God says. And what God says, nobody can stop it. If it's in your own life, as long as you do not stop it, nobody can stop it. And in our own society, in our church, In the name of Jesus, nobody can stop it. The glory of the latter house. There are two laws that govern affairs in this world. Two laws. Spiritual laws, as you say, because there are natural laws, physical laws, scientific laws. But there are two spiritual laws that govern they are fears of this war, basically. The first of them is the law of sin and death. The law of sin and death came into operation when man sinned. 
And with sin came decadence, judgment, decay. When God made creation at the beginning, nothing decayed. There was no decay. Everything was pristine. Everything was beautiful. Everything was glorious. But when sin came to the picture, it brought with it decadence. Things, circumstances, people, since then till now, decay. The natural tendency of things outside God is decay. If you pluck the rose flower, it's a very beautiful thing. It has a very beautiful scent, and the petals are very beautiful. But as beautiful as the rose flower is, once you pluck it, put it in your hand, a few moments after plucking it, you will have to throw it away. Because as soon as you pluck it, it begins to die. The law of sin and death is a universal law in this world outside of Christ. Things outside of Christ are bound to decay. I don't know what that, I don't care what that thing is. Whether it's money or material things or people. Anything that is not hidden in Christ, anything that is not put in his hands will decay. If people knew this, you wouldn't have to beg anybody to accept Christ. But it's because they are blind. There is no abiding life. There is no abiding joy. There is no abiding glory anywhere outside Christ. All the glories of this world are fickle. They pine away, they fade away. There is no lasting glory in the world. The glory of this world is a limited glory. It's a glory that decays. And I will try to show that to you. But anything that is rooted in the life of God does not decay. Amen. Amen. You as an essential creature of God will never decay. Amen. This body, our bodies do decay. If it pleases God that we go home before he comes back, the body will go its own direction. When God made man, he took the soil from the ground. But the breath came from him. And it is the breath that upholds the rest. When the breath comes out of this tabernacle of clay, they say the person is dead. It is the life of God that upholds things everywhere. Those of you in the sciences, you know this better than I do. One of the laws of thermodynamics is the law of entropy. I did a little bit of physics when I was in secondary school. I couldn't pursue it because of my maths. But I was telling my wife the other day before we crossed over to form four, I was one of the best in physics, in biology, in chemistry. But I couldn't go further because my maths was not too good. I became an art student. Entropy tells you everything tends toward randomness. That's what it tells you. That things in themselves tend toward decay. Anything, I have said that. If the Lord tarries for a thousand years before he comes, one day this building will cease to exist. It will decay into its constituent parts. It will become soil again. The shoes you are wearing today will not always be there. After some years, those shoes, entropy is already working on them. Decay is already setting on them. One day you will have to throw it away. Or you give somebody, the person uses it, one day they will have to throw it away. And what is you're wearing on your feet today will one day be in the dung hill. And they will, they will put fire on it. And when they put fire on it, it will melt. And that will be the end of it. So, even in the sciences, decay is recognized. It's the second law of thermodynamics. 
in the humanities, decay is the order of the day. The rhythm of life is that things rise only to fall again. Empires rise to fall again. Kings reign to fall again. Somebody might reign, no matter how long he reigns, one day he will not be there. One of the richest kings, in fact, the richest king that ever came out of Africa was Mansa Musa of Mali. Mansa Musa was so rich, gold was like dust to Mansa Musa. He visited Mecca in the 11th century. And as he was going, he was distributing gold. You won't believe it's the same Africa. As he was going and as he was coming from Mecca, he was distributing gold. In Egypt, he distributed so much gold, the price of gold crashed. Mansa Musa was the richest, as far as I remember now. No king in the whole of Africa was as rich as Mansa Musa of Mali. The Sankore University, the oldest university in Africa, was in his territory. People used to come to study there from different parts of the world. Mansa Musa. But what happened? Eventually, he died. Eventually, his reign came to an end. Eventually, his affluence came to an end. And today, we only mention him in history. In fact, many of you probably have never heard of Mansa Musa before. But there was a time he was not just living here. Till today, there is no African king that has been as rich as Mansa Musa of Mali. What am I trying to say? This law that says everything that goes up must come down. We're talking about the glory of the latter house. What was the glory like before man sinned? The man that God made was not a slave. The man that God made was a master in his own house. The man that God made did not just live, he reigned. Adam reigned. The estate, the garden into which God put him, there were four rivers. Or if you like, tributaries of the Tigris and the Euphrates. In the estate in which God put Adam and Eve. So if today you recognize, you, 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 you accept wretchedness, it's your choice. But God never made man and joined wretchedness to his destiny. And I pray your life will not be a wretched life. Because the very first human beings that God made, they were not wretched. They lived for God. But they lived in opulence. Four rivers in the Garden of Eden where they lived. And the whole place was filled with mines. Not just gold mines. Go to the book of Genesis and you read all kinds of... And it says the gold of that land was good. There was gold there. But gold was not the only thing. There were all kinds of things that were in the land. Where God put Adam and Eve. Whatever God has put in your own garden, by the grace of God, may you see it. Because somebody can be living on acres of gold. If he doesn't see it, he doesn't see it. And what you don't see, spiritually, you cannot enjoy. In Jesus' name, what God has buried in your own estate, you will see it. God will open your understanding and he will let you see, son, I put you in a territory. I put you in a place of massive blessing. So, the man that God made before there was sin was not a wretched human being. Four rivers, and he didn't need a bridge to cross from one side to another. You say, how did he cross? I believe he crossed the way Jesus walked on water. The glory in which 
the first human beings lived was so grand and so great compared to the wealth of the richest man in the world now, these people who call the richest people in the world will look wretched compared to Adam and Eve. Isn't that true? Okay. The richest man in the world now is Jeff Bezos, the owner of Amazon. He's the richest man in the world, followed by Bill Gates, followed by Wolf, uh, uh, Buffett, Warren Buffett. These are the richest people in the world right now. But compared to what Adam and Eve had, all of these people that version to you will look like paupers. They look like paupers. If somebody has a visitation from heaven now, once in a lifetime, it will be, it will be, it will be a record. Isn't that true? He will continue to say, four years ago, the Lord visited me. And everybody will say, wow. The Lord visited me. He said, yes. Wow. It will be history all over the world. But do you know that with Adam and Eve, God visited them every evening. God visited them every evening. In fact, it was in one of such evenings when he came, he didn't find them. So I said, where are thou? He came to visit them. By the grace of God, one of these days, the Lord will visit you. Yeah. And when he comes, he will find you. Yeah. He will not say, Adam, where art thou? Anyway, that was the dignity and the glory in which our first parents in the flesh lived. It's, 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 I mean, it's beyond what you can talk about. If somebody has a house now in a lorry, and the house has a swimming pool, they will say he's a comfortable person. Isn't that true? Eh? Demola, they have a swimming pool in their house. They say, wow, thank God for this. They are doing well. But Adam and Eve had four rivers in their own estate. Because I don't want you to have a poverty mentality. Pinching things when you should live in the abundance of God. Not only in Christ are you destined to live in God's abundance. You are supposed to be, on behalf of God, a distributor of his blessings. When people come to you, don't say, I don't have it. You have what? You have more than what they need. Eh? The man in Acts 3 was begging for money. The man didn't have money, but he didn't send him away. He gave him something that was more than money. Isn't that true? He gave him what money could not buy. In the name of Jesus, every one of you, you will have what money can buy. But beyond that, you also have what money cannot buy. You have the virtue of Christ in you. You have the glory of God in you. You have the grace of God in you. You have the spirit of God in you. And you have the life of God in you. I know you've heard all these things. But by the grace of God, you will not just hear them. You will live in the reality of them. So this was what? The glory looked like before they sing. You say, really? I cannot money when but they say to turn it. To sin is always a cheap bargain. The person who lives in sin is his own worst enemy. What God has called you, eh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Eh, yeah, you have set to, you have lived this great thing, and you have set to for this wretchedness. That was the glory in which they lived before there was sin. Now let us look at the glory after sin came. It became a fading glory, as I've, as I've said already. Because anything that is not in God will fade. No matter how much you polish it, it will fade. One of the best ways to use your money is to use it for God. Because when you use your money for God here, you will reap the profits here. You will reap the profits when we get to heaven. When you use your money for God here. Praise the Lord. Romans 3.23, it says, Man sinned and came short of the, thank you, of the glory of God. 
But this sinful man, let us still see the residue, the remnant of grace that remain in his life. This man, let's still see the remnant. Okay, there are things you know, I will remind you. Sinful man, ordinary man. What has he gone? He has gone to the moon. He's not born again, but to tell you the majesty that God has planted in his soul, man has walked on the moon. And the people who, came, who went to the moon, I don't think they were born again. But you are born again. I said you are born again. So you may not walk on the moon, but by the grace of God, your life will not be tied to the ground. Sinful man has walked on the moon. Before what man walked on the moon in April 1969, that was when Neil Armstrong walked on the moon. It was in April 1969. Before then, the Russians had sent the first human being to space. That happened in 1957. The first human being was in space, not the moon, space. But in 1969, the Americans beat the Russians by not only sending man to space, but sending the first man to the moon. We are talking about the achievements, the glory of sinful man. Man that in the eyes of God is inferior to you because he's, he does not know God. He does not carry the life of God. In the capability of God. Like you do. I said like you do. You will not sit down there and vegetate away. The stuff that God has put in you will manifest. They don't want it to manifest. But in Jesus name your enemies will fail. I'm trying to paint pictures to you. And I don't want you to sleep. Because this is how you sleep. When things about your destiny have been talked about. And when a man sleeps, when the most important things about him are being said, he's not going anywhere. How can somebody be sleeping when you are talking about his destiny? Anyway, sinful man inferior to you has gone to the moon. Then you look at things like, no, man has not just gone to the moon. Man is already now sending robots to Mars. The latest is that robots are now landing in Mars. Man has not been able to go there because they are still studying the environment. The environment is different from the environment in the moon. But you can bet it, I will not be too surprised if one of these days, the first human being steps on Mars. Right now, robots are landing in Mars. Americans have done it. So many others have done it. Do you know the other day, bro, in Dubai, they sent the first, they sent the first rocket to space. Dubai that in 1960, I think we were even superior to Dubai. This same Dubai. Google it. You, you go, if you Google it, I say, what did Dubai look like in 1960? Google will show you. But today, they are sending rockets to space. In the name of Jesus, Nigeria will not remain here. Because some of the most intelligent human beings in the world are from this country. Anyway, sinful man has gone to the moon. Sinful man has gone to space. Look at aeroplanes. You travel in a plane. It's an extraordinary wonder of science. How did it start? It started with the Wright brothers. The Wright brothers were the first to experiment with making planes. They were bicycle mechanics. They were not PhD in physics. Bicycle mechanics. And they experimented. It didn't look like it was positive, but they didn't give up. They played their part. They held on to the dream. After a lot of effort, the first contraption they made was able to fly for 12 seconds. The aircraft that the Wright brothers made just flew for 12 seconds. 
and it fell back to the ground. But today, aviation is number one in transportation. It's regarded as the safest form of traveling, aviation. It started with the Wright brothers. I think it was 1903. It started with their experiment. If you are experimenting with something noble now, don't give up. Don't give up. You may not be able to finish it. You may not be able to attain to the desire that you would have wanted. But by the grace of God, the dream will not die. If you don't finish it, somebody will take up from where you stopped. And they will finish it. You were born to noble ends. And by the grace of God, it will manifest to the glory of God. Sinful man, aircraft, planes. Look at the sheep. Sheep. I know those of us who are here, uh, we may, you have to get to places like Lagos. But even many sheep you see in Lagos are not the very modern ones. Modern sheep can be as, you, they can be, some of them, 25 stories high. And it's a sheep. In 1912, the British built a ship called the Titanic. And they were so confident of themselves, the scientists said, even God will not be able to sink this ship. Again, if you ask Google, Google will show you the Titanic, 1912. And so it was built and it launched out and they said they would travel from Britain to New York. But because of what they said, God destroyed their efforts. They said even God, I don't know which of the scientists said that. He said even God will not be able to sink it. So when the person said it, it became something that God had to answer to. And God answered to it and the Titanic sank in that 1912. And it sank. Over thousands of people were on board. I think about only about 700 and something lived. The rest perished. Because somebody said, even God. Ah. He spoke certain things against God. So, those of us who are men of God from that area, we have been using it to pray against him. Say, Lord, heaven bless you. What he said, he said it against you. And if anybody has said anything against the will of God in your life, let it become your prayer point. You don't even have to quote from the Bible. Say, Father, this is what so and so said. Lord, the ball is in your car because he must know that it's not a He's not God, he's a human being. And God will answer you. Maybe somebody has said he cannot pass. Maybe somebody has said he cannot get married. Maybe somebody has said never. he can never amount to anything. That becomes your prayer point. God likes to take up such challenges. That was why the Titanic sank. And when it sank in 1912, they didn't find it again until 1985. It sank to the bottom of the sea. Do you remember some years ago, this plane, for this Malaysian Airlines plane, that sank? You don't remember? And they searched for it and searched for it. Till today, they didn't find it. Because if God hides something, you can't see it. No scientific equipment can see it. Malaysian plane. And it was traveling just a short distance, and it dropped into the sea. And they sagged and sagged and sagged and sagged. And sagged in the Pacific. And they couldn't find it. Because God was trying to demonstrate to sinful man that even though the remnant of the glory is still on him, it is God who has the last word. Things that, let me jump because of time. I'm trying to tell you the glory you still see 
in the sinful world. The remnant, the residue. The most intelligent person in the world is Chris Langer of the United States. His IQ is between 190 and 210. Now, Albert Einstein, one of the most intelligent people in the world, his IQ was 150. That of Chris Langan is 190, between 90, 190 and 210. But if he's not saved, the whole thing will come to nothing. Because all flesh is grass. The glory of man is as the flower of the grass. It says, the grass will wither and the flower thereof will fall off. That is why you must put your life in the hands of God. That's why you must follow Jesus. I said, that's why you must continue to follow Jesus. Because that's the best choice. Everything else will come to ashes. Anything that you see today will turn to ashes. But if it is in the hand of Jesus, even if it burns, it cannot be consumed. Can somebody say amen? As the beauty of being a child of God. So, you see that even people who have not known the Lord see what man has done, naturally speaking. The natural man has done. Now, the coming glory. When a man is saved, he is not just somebody whose sins have been forgiven, he becomes a tabernacle of the Most High God. He becomes somebody in, who, in, in whom the Lord dwells. He is God's address. And that is not playing with words. That's not it. We are not being elegant with words when we say that. That is the truth. That's what the Bible says. In 2 Corinthians 6, 16, he says, I will dwell in them and I will walk in them. I will be their God. They will be my people. In 1 Corinthians 3, 16, he said, do you not know that? You are the temple of God and that the spirit of God dwells where? In you. You know that already. And we are saying in the name of Jesus Christ, what is in you will come out. The glory that is in you in Christ will come out. It will not only come out, it will come out fully. It will come out maximally in the name of Jesus you will not just be a believer, you will be a top grade disciple. The carrier of the glory that comes from above. That's what you will be by the blood of Jesus. That's what you'll be in the name of Jesus. That's what you'll be. You are a man under construction. We have seen a little bit of the beauty, but that is not the end. By the grace of God, the greater glory will manifest in your life. Keep coming to see the Lord in Champions Church and he will walk out the rest in his mercy. Keep coming. The Lord knows how he's going to do it. Because there is an investment in you and it must not be wasted investment. In the world when people have made investment, they guard their investments jealously. That's what they do. Why are you doing it? I say, well, I invested so much. God has made the greatest investment in your life. That by the grace of God, your life will not be a wasted life. Luke 6.40. Luke 6.40 says, The disciple is not greater than his master. But everyone that is perfect shall be. Somebody read it for me. I want you to mark that place in your Bible. The disciple is not above his master. But everyone that is perfect shall be as his master. Every disciple that is perfect shall be what? Shall be what? Aha. And you remember in your mind now things you have read about the glory in which Jesus lived. He says every disciple that is perfect is expected to live like that. The problem with many of us who are believers is that we are underdeveloped. Disciple is not greater than his master. It's not possible. Water cannot rise above his source. 
He said, but the disciple that is mature shall be like his master. And that is for you. By the grace of God, you will walk like the master. You will talk like the master. You will live like the master. You will understand like the master. The forces of darkness could not crack Jesus. They will not be able to crack him. You will be an impossible nut for the enemy to crack. But he says, the disciple that is perfect or the disciple that is mature. This is where the problem lies. The brethren are not growing. They're satisfied with little things. When God has called you to the great feast. But by the grace of God, your spiritual appetite is going to increase. As your spiritual appetite increases, you will be growing. I said you will be growing. Be growing by leaps and bounds. Nothing about you will resemble Egypt anymore. Everything about you will portray Jesus. We will not leave you alone. The Lord must see that glory. He paid the price. And by the grace of God, his investment will not be wasted. Every Christian in this place, as the day is coming, which the world is getting darker and darker, by his grace, his light in you must be shining brighter and brighter. These are not the days to put one step forward and five steps backwards. These are the days to stand up to be counted for the master. These are the days to be with the Lord every fellowship day. Come to church. Worship the Lord. The people of, this, of the world are following Satan. You can see it now. And the master is also looking down from heaven. He said, I'm waiting for my people. And the people say, it's Boko Haram. The Lord says, no, it's my people. And we say, no, it's Al-Shabaab. The Lord says, no. The Al-Shabaab people, they are just a piece of cake. If my people who are called by my name shall humble themselves and seek my face and repent of their evil ways, he said, I will answer from heaven. That is going to happen in your life. That is going to happen in this church. That is going to happen in the church as a whole. In the, in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. That's where we're going to. It's a message for another day. But I'm saying in the name of Jesus, while the best of the world is behind, the best for the church is ahead. That's how it works. The law of the spirit of life in Christ Jesus and the law of sin and death. The lot of sin and death. With things that decay, the best is always behind. I told you about the rose flower. Before you cut it, it was very beautiful. Then you pluck it. While you pluck it in your hand, it's still, the beauty is still there. But if you leave it for some hours, it will begin to faint and fade. And those petals, one by better, seem raw, low way, until you throw it away. With the world, the glory is always behind. But with the church, the glory is ahead. That's why you have to know how you talk and how you prepare yourself. Because the best for your life is not behind, it's ahead. God has the timetable. God has the plan. And it is my prayer that you will cooperate with God. Even you cannot tear what God is able to do with your life. In 1 Corinthians chapter 2, Paul said, What eyes have not seen, nor ears have, things that have not occurred to the heart of man, those are the things that God has laid in store for those who love him. And you are one of them. I said you love the Lord, therefore, certain things God has in mind for you, they have not even occurred to your mind. So when people are talking about rottenness and talking about decay, by the grace of God, the Lord of decay will not be part of your story. You are waiting for greater glory, greater testimonies, greater anointings, greater exploits. Because for the church, the best is not behind, it's in front. I close with this. Let me show you something. In Genesis chapter 1, Somebody read verses 5, 8, 13. Genesis 1, 5, 8, 13. 
Yes. And the darkness he called night. Yes. And the evening and the morning were the first day. Yes. And the firmament heaven. And the evening and the morning were the second day. Yes. Thirteen. And the evening and the morning were the third day. God bless you, my daughter. Sit down. You find this rhythm in Genesis 1. The evening and the morning, the first day. The evening and the morning, the second day. The, now, naturally, that's not how we reckon our day. Man's day begins with the morning. Isn't that true? When you woke up this morning, did you wake up in the evening? You woke up in the morning. Man's day starts with the morning and ends in the evening. But God's day starts in the evening. And it ends in the morning. That's why the Bible says, weeping may endure for the night, but joy comes. Stand up before the Lord and thank him for your life. These are the principles shaping your destiny. Lift up your hand and be excited. Not because you have 5,000 naira in the bank, but because there's a principle at work in your life that the world cannot stop. Your own day starts in the evening. God's day starts in the evening and it ends in the morning. It has been dark. Yes, morning is coming. Morning is coming. Rejoice in that. You will not end with that palaver. That palaver will end very soon because your father's day starts in the evening and ends in the morning. Evening and morning were the first day. Evening and morning were the second day. God's day starts in the evening. When man has come to the climax and begins to decline, man will begin to see another glory that the world cannot explain. Out of death comes life. Out of weakness comes strength. Out of hopelessness comes joy. Out of, out, of, out, of, out, of, out of torment comes testimony. It's been hard for you. The next thing now is your testimony. Lift your voice as that revelation grabs your heart and talk to your father. Don't let it waste. Don't be so full. Don't let it waste. You've seen the evening. It's not the end of your own day. You will see the morning. You will see the morning. We'll finish the story another time of the glory of the latter house. But there is something ahead of you as a child of God that the world does not have. The fading glories of this world cannot capture them. They can't capture them. Thank you, Jesus. In Jesus' name we pray. In Jesus' name we pray. In Jesus' name we pray. Everyone that is here this morning and you are saved and you have the spirit of God in you, things concerning you will not die. Your hope will not die. Your joy will not die. You do not just have life, you have everlasting life. Therefore, in the name of Jesus, that life in you will never die. That the Lord of the spirit of life in Christ Jesus has set you free from the law of sin and death. Therefore, I speak into the lives of God's people. Disaster is not your portion. Decay is not your portion. Your destiny will not decay. Your joy will not decay. Your peace will not decay. Your health will not decay. That the Lord of the spirit of life in Christ Jesus has set you free from the Lord of sin and death. People will see you and they will know that Jesus 
is in control of your case. And because Jesus is in control of your case, your case will be different. Somebody experienced something similar and died, your case will be different. Somebody traveled by that road, they didn't arrive, your case will be different. Somebody went to that school and failed, your case will be different. Somebody was not able to finish in record time. Your case will be different. These people in whose life the Lord of the Spirit of life in Christ consumes the Lord of sin and death. And as you go back to the valley in the name of Jesus you will not lose the fire. Right there, as you go after this service, the glory will go with you. You will shine to the glory of God. You will run, you will not be weary. You will walk, you will not be tired. The wisdom of God will pilot your life. You will know what to do and what not to do. Discouragement is not your portion. In the name of Jesus, God's courage will swallow your discouragement. When they look at you, they will see you on top. Because the evening is the beginning. It's not your end. Not long after this, they will see your morning. Coming with blessings. Coming with greater testimonies. This very you, <laughs> they will see a wonder. Nobody thought he would die. But he's back. It's not only back. He's back with a vengeance. But that is your story. In Jesus' name, I declare. Amen. Amen. Amen.